not everyone is going to accept your message. Not everyone's going to like you, but go and, and, and share the message. And, they, and then we get this story of, of John the Baptist dying, but now the disciples are back from their mission trip. And if you've ever been on a mission trip, it's, it's an amazing thing. God works. I mean, I'm sure that they witnessed things and saw things that, that were amazing. And, and they get with Jesus, and they want to tell him about what all that had happened. They were casting demons out of people, and amazing things, I'm sure, happened. The only problem was people, people. People were all around Jesus all the time. They were there, always. And, and so, verse 31, Jesus says something that must have been music to the disciples' ears. I love this. I often imagine Jesus saying this to me. Verse 31, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. That is, that is beautiful. That is, that is Jesus. So, so often we want to get with Jesus alone, but this is Jesus saying that to the disciples. That's intentionality. That's Jesus saying, I love you. I know you had a week. I want to get with you. I want to hear all about it. Let's go. It lasts a verse. Verse 32. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place, a quiet place. And after, after verse 32, you, you heard the story. It's crazy town for the disciples after this moment. Jesus appears to be reorienting his disciples to something. And he doesn't necessarily tell them that it's happening. He's just doing these things, hoping that his disciples catch on, that they get what he's doing. And as, as readers, we are in the place of his disciples. We are the ones asking, what's going on here? What happened to the restful time? Uh, why is he caring so much about the 5,000? And how is he going to feed all these people? I mean, all those questions and more. And then if you noticed, verse 52, Mark, we hear Mark's voice interjecting. Another piece of the puzzle, after, after Jesus walks on water, intending to pass by, he comes in the boat, the wind dies down, the disciples are amazed, and then Mark adds, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. Uh, wait, what was it, or is it about the loaves that would have helped the disciples to connect the dots as to why Jesus was going to pass by the boat. Speaking of, why was Jesus going to pass by the boat? It, that's what Mark says. Mark says that he doesn't come to aid the disciples. Mark says he came to pass by the boat. What? what? Well, and I, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting ahead of myself here. But I, I want you to see that there is much more going on in the text than some cute story about Jesus doing something amazing, doing something that no human can do, walk on water. There's a lot more here. There's a discipleship principle here that, we, that we've got to wrestle with. We've got to think what's happening Mark's, Mark's telling us something here. There's a nugget. There's a, there's a gold nugget we got to dig to see what is going on. So let's go back to the tired disciples who are promised some rest and relaxation, some R&R &R with Jesus. They get in the boat, and right away, right when they land, the crowds, the people are there. The crowd is there. They beat them to it. The text says that Jesus has seized the crowd, has compassion on the crowd. To him, they're like sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus starts teaching them. 
and, and then <laughs> verse 35 starts off w- with M- Mark gives us time markers, which are, are going are gonna to be used elsewhere in the story uh, that are important to take note of. Mark says that it's getting late in the day, and, and maybe you could just picture, maybe you could picture the disciples going to Jesus, just, you know, ah, hey, Jesus, you know, everybody is, is really tired and, and, and hungry. It's getting late, and, and we, you, should, you should send the crowd away. And, and remember, I don't, maybe you forgot, you, you promised us some, some time together, alone, quiet place. And you, oh, Jesus, there was something that happened on our mission trip. You just, I can't wait to tell you about it. So, you know, I really do, everybody thinks it's, it's time. You should dismiss the crowd. They listen to you more than me. Trust me. So, so just d- d- dismiss the crowd, and then we can have our time together. We can eat in that quiet place. And then Jesus just looks at them in verse 37, says, you give them something to eat. Now, right here, right here, things, in the disciples' mind, things start to get jumbled up here. Because Jesus appears to be putting the needs of the disciples lower than the needs of the crowd around him, the the people without a shepherd. He is reorienting the priority system right, right in front of them. If you are a follower of Jesus, your needs come beneath the needs of non followers. There are these arounders that, that Mark chapter 4, if you, so if you were with us a month ago, I tried to explain the way Mark has written his gospel. You've got the insiders. The, the, those are the 12 disciples that, that, that follow Jesus. He, he calls them. He follows them. You've got the insiders. Then you've got the outsiders. And those, the, those are twofold people. Those are people actively opposed to Jesus. Those are the, the religious elites, the, the Pharisees, the, the teachers of the law that do not like what Jesus is doing. They do not like it. And also with the outsiders are people just indifferent about Jesus. They, they, they do not care about him, what, what's happening. They, it makes no difference in their life at all. Those are the outsiders. And then you've got the arounders. The people that are around, the crowds around Jesus all the time. Th- these are people that are interested in Jesus. They're, they're curious a- about him. They haven't committed yet. That they're, they're, not, they're not with the disciples yet, but they are invested. That they, they are engaged with Jesus. Now you would think, you would think if you become the member of this small group of insiders, the disciples, you would think that your needs get top priority over everybody. Oh, especially over the arounders. But Jesus reorients that perspective. The, the ironic thing is that you actually would have had more priority if you were just an arounder instead of an insider with Jesus. It seems in the text that Jesus is prioritizing the arounders over the insiders to some degree. When you're hungry and tired, those are are physical needs that do not trump the needs of the arounders because guess what? They're hungry and tired too. So the disciples are taken aback, rightfully so. They're, They're humbled. As they, as they blabber, oh, that would take eight months' wages to, to, to feed a crowd this big. I mean, that's 5,000 people. Most commentators or Bible study notes, you read that and, and you say that was 5,000, probably men. 5,000 men. That, what about the women, the children that were there? We're talking now, think the size of Sydney. 
One meal, feeding all those people. It's just, how are we going to do this? You give them something to eat. What does that, how, what does that mean? Jesus asks how many, how many loaves we got. They look, five loaves and two fish. Then note, Jesus directs the disciples to have the crowd sit down in the green grass. Did you note that? Psalm 23, the, the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. So the disciples are making the crowd sit down, and then Jesus <laughs> gives thanks to God, breaks the loaves of bread apart, and then he gives them to the disciples to serve the crowd. So let's recap here. His disciples are tired and hungry, and now humbled as they serve the arounders, the crowd. The, the disciples, the, the first are last. Do you see? Verse 43. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. So, so after all of that, which was, again, tremendously reorienting for the disciples, the 12 disciples pick up 12 basketfuls of leftovers, and lo and behold, then they get to eat. Everybody got to eat. It was just enough for everybody to eat a full meal. Which tells me, if you're a follower of Jesus, you will probably not eat first. You will probably not eat fresh. You will probably eat leftovers. And if you're not okay with that, then following Jesus probably will not go well for you. You will be confused a lot of the time as to what is going on here. What is Jesus doing? Why is Jesus doing it? It's like you have eyes to see and ears to hear, but nothing makes sense. Because you need to have the right heart, a servant's heart, a, an openness to put yourself last, an openness to, to being opposed upon. The, the kind of heart, that, that kind of understanding, that kind of engagement with Jesus as a reality seems to be an essential part and piece to understand all the other things that Jesus is saying and doing. And his ushering in of the kingdom of God and your important place in the kingdom of God. Because newsflash, you do not live in a neutral world. You live in a heavily contested space. Pa Pastor John Tyson says this, The world has a vision for humans. They, the, the world wants you to be greedy, unrestrained, anxious consumers, addicted to dopamine rewards. That's what the world wants. Satan has a vision for humanity, for you. The enemy wants you to be selfish, fixated on entitlement, victimhood, success, sex, pleasure, power. Jesus has a vision for you. He wants you to be a godly, passionate, life-giving person that puts other needs in front of your own. After I was saved as a, as a young man, I went to a Christian camp in the, in the hills of, of Missouri. It was a big camp, and I was a counselor. And everybody had the camp motto just drilled into us. Yeah, counselors, kids. It was, it was really easy. It was really awesome. It was two words. 
I'm third. God's first. Others are second. I'm third. And it was easy at camp. I mean, every that was what every that was the air we breathed. I'm third. I'm third. I could I could I could say two words to a kid, and they got it. Oh, hey, bud, I'm third. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, I'm third. That's it. It was awesome. It was easy. It was great. It was it was life giving. It was awesome. And then we went home. And everything. The world, the flesh, the devil, everything is saying the exact opposite. You're, you're not third, you're first. Treat yourself. You deserve it. Just look after you and yours and that's it. You're not third. Are we ready for God to define what the good life is. Are we really, really ready for God to tell us what the good life is and for us to receive it as good? Jesus is showing his disciples what the good life is. It's delayed gratification. It's putting others' needs in front of your own. It's, it's being a servant. It's being last. This is, this is not what naturally comes up when we think of the good life. But it seems to be the way that Jesus says is the good life. It is the way. This is deeply reorienting to the the disciples and to us. But the story continues. Verse 45. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat, go on ahead to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went on the mountain to pray. So now the plot thickens. Jesus instructs his disciples after the meal, get in the boat, head to Bethsaida. They don't land in Bethsaida, which is reorienting. They don't go there. They go to Gennesaret. Anyway, okay, so um, he, he dismisses the crowd, which 5,000 people, you know, when I'm out there dismissing you all, it takes a bit. So 5,000, this takes a bit. This takes a while. Jesus then goes on the mountain to pray, instructs the disciples, hey, meet me over at Bethsaida. The disciples don't know how Jesus is going to get to Bethsaida, but they are obedient. Now, here comes the time markers in the story. The next line says, evening came. So anywhere, so evening in the Greek is 6 p.m. to 6, or yeah, 6 p.m. to, to 9 p.m. Okay, anywhere in there is evening. Jesus looks down, sees his disciples in the middle of, of the lake. Think Lake McConaughey, if you've been to Lake McConaughey. Sea of Galilee is kind of like that. Maybe Sea of Galilee is a little wider in some spots, but it's big. Big lake. Jesus on the mountain sees his disciples straining against the wind in the evening. Then it says, early in the morning, the fourth watch of the night, which is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., Jesus comes walking on the water. So, so let's get this straight. Jesus does not look up from prayer, see his disciples straining, and go immediately to them. Jesus could have waited at least 12 hours, at the greatest 12 hours. That's the most time that it could have been. Uh, that Mark records, 12 hours of time goes by. 12 hours of the disciples straining to, get, to, to be obedient to Jesus. Let's get to Bethsaida. 12 hours. The disciples spend the night in the wind and the waves. Jesus spends the night praying. Now, why in the world did Jesus take so long? To understand why, it is necessarily necessary to understand why he finally comes. He does not come to join his struggling disciples in the boat and calm the storm, even though that is what happened. That's what happened, but that's not what Mark says was the purpose. 
verse 48 clearly states, He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, period. Now, class, what's the significance of the Lord passing by? Is there a story in the Hebrew scriptures of the Lord passing by? Oh, Ding, ding, ding. I'm remembering in the book of Exodus, the Lord, after the Lord redeemed his people from, from Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, God led Moses and the Israelites out of the desert to the Mount Sinai where, where a covenant took place. God got down on one knee and proposed to, to the people, will you be my people? Yes, yes. God gives them the law, the Ten Commandments. And Moses is there at the top of the Mount Sinai. And God puts him in the cleft of the rock. And he passes, the Lord passes by and declares his name, his full name, Yahweh, Yahweh. The compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. The name of God. This is a huge moment in the storyline of the Bible. So Jesus desires to reveal to his disciples even more of who he is. His desire is to replay this famous scene. He was going to pass by, but they saw him, and instead of remembering Exodus 34, the disciples see him, freak out, think it's a ghost, and, and are terrified. So they see him, but they don't see him. So then Jesus draws near and tries another tactic. But it does not land on them, and quite frankly, it doesn't land on us because of our English translations of the Bible. In the Greek, verse 50 literally says, Take courage, I am, don't be afraid. That's what it says. Now, no doubt in your Bibles or on your phones, it says, Take courage, it's me, don't be afraid. Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. In the Greek, I don't know how else to say, it's, it's ego a me. I am. Now, now, I understand why they, they did what they did. It doesn't flow. It's clunky. It, in English, it's just better to say it's me. It's, it's I. But that's not. What it says is Jesus, take courage. I am. Don't be afraid. Now, class. I am. Where have we heard I am before? Oh, yes. The book of Exodus. Moses drawing, or God drawing Moses out. God saying to Moses, you're going to be the one that's going to take my people out of Egypt. And Moses, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I have all these excuses. And then Moses says, what, what am I going to tell the Pharaoh as to who this the name of this God is and, and God famously from the burning bush that doesn't burn up says tell him I am has sent you I am who I am oh this is the eternally present one this is the the uncaused cause the one that go everything goes back to I am. And Jesus says, I am, gets into the boat, the wind dies down, and, and the way Mark has it written, the, the disciples are amazed that he quieted another storm. They're not amazed at what he said. They didn't hear him. Then Mark adds, for they did not understand about the loaves, their hearts were hardened. So there's something here. Students, there's something, some clue that the disciples missed and we're supposed to ponder. Something linking this event to the reorienting feeding miracle. And it could be this. So I've, I've 
I've had the privilege of, of wrestling with this for a week, okay? And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. I want you to wrestle with it for a week. It could be this. Although Jesus has the power to do mighty deeds, he does not always exercise it in order to lighten the load for his followers. Let me say that again. Although Jesus has the power to do mighty deeds, he does not always exercise it in order to lighten the load for his followers. This entire episode is dizzying to the disciples. What is going on? They have eyes, but they're not understanding. They have ears, but they're not hearing. The, the, and then Mark says that their hearts are hardened. Now, 21st century, when we read that, oh, a, a hardened heart, we think uncaring. That's what, that's what us modern days, when somebody says, oh, his heart's hard, he's, he's not, this is not a caring person. That's not what first century how they read it, how they understood hard-hearted. Hard-hearted in the first century is unteachable. So someone that is unwilling to learn. Uh, the cement is hard. It's not wet anymore. It's hard-hearted means stubborn, rigid. So it's not that the, the disciples are not caring. It's, it's at the moment in the boat... They're unwilling to connect the dots. They're tired. They're hungry. They spent a whole night up. They were, they were promised something by Jesus that they didn't get. They're frustrated. And, and they don't understand, and they don't want to understand. They don't want to think about it. Does it bother you? that the disciples were struggling for 12 hours and Jesus seems to be doing nothing. Does that bother you? Let me go at it this way. In 2005, so I was in college, I was studying to be a youth pastor, and I heard about this study that was being done in, in of the, Amer the spiritual lives of American teenagers. And I thought to myself, I better pay attention to this. <laughs> this seems interesting. And what they did, all different faiths, Muslim, Jewish, Christian, all different denominations in Christianity, if, if they were spiritual teenagers, they got, they, they got asked a bunch of questions, and all this data was done, and it was super interesting. Because this is what the data pointed to. Number one, teenagers in 2005 who were, who were raised in the church, in the faith, whatever faith it was, they believed in God. Great. But their, their view of God is, was, in 2005, was that God is a cosmic butler. He, he, or a genie in a bottle. He, he wants to make your, his, his purpose for existing is to make your life better. To make you happy is the purpose of God. And our lives, is that's our purpose, is just to be happy. Now, I... I I don't know how else to say this other than, I have to be crystal clear, that, that that idea, that concept is thoroughly unbiblical. That is not in the Bible. That the purpose of life is to be happy. It's not there. When I read this story, when, when, when I read books like Job, like Ecclesiastes, First Peter, Second Peter, uh, any of Paul's letters, who, Paul, who said, "To live is Christ; to die is gain." I ask you again: Does it bother you that the disciples were struggling for twelve hours and Jesus didn't seem to help? Jesus 
might be up to something that something other than getting the disciples out of trouble maybe something even more more important we have no idea what he was praying about do we we have no idea can we trust god that it was more whatever it was was more important than helping his friends See, this is the rub. We want to set the parameters of how God loves us. We think we know better. We we look at this story and say, that's not loving. We think we know best. We think we know what love looks like. But we have historically gotten it wrong every single time. (laughs) Every single time that we take the posture that we know better than God, we can't. Here's a few examples. In the Hebrew Scriptures, we ask God for a king. God gives us Saul. That was a terrible king. But then up springs David, who no one thought would be a good king. He didn't look like a king. He was a shepherd. We asked for a Messiah that would be rich and powerful. God gave us a baby to a poor couple, teenage couple. We wanted a Messiah that would overthrow Rome. Jesus overthrew death itself. See, Our concepts are either too small or or misplaced. We don't, we're not good at telling God what's good. Lord, thank you for giving us what we do not ask for. This is what Mark is making us ask. Can we let God show us what love is? And and when he shows us whatever it is, can we receive it as love? Can we take it and know he knows better than me? He's got a bigger perspective on what's going on. I can trust him. Even though it's very reorienting, I can trust him. Because again, I, I believe Jesus was, was passing by that boat to remind the disciples, I, I am Yahweh. And they didn't catch it. They didn't see it. And then he says, I am, and they didn't hear it. They didn't understand. At the cross, Jesus was showing humanity how much God loves them and we didn't get it. We didn't understand. At the cross, Jesus was showing what love is, what forgiveness is, and he was laughed at, spit on, beaten, mocked, made fun of. And those insiders, those disciples that should have been there, gone. Even at the resurrection, at the resurrection, the insiders are scared to death. Mary Magdalene's there, does it at first, doesn't get it. Thought he, thought he was a gardener. Thank God it clicked, though. It, it clicked with her, and she told the disciples, and it took some time, but it finally clicked. Praise God. But listen, you are not always going to understand God. You are not. And join the club. Y- 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 You will join a long list of followers of Christ who thought they had Jesus figured out. But then he zagged when he thought he'd zig. And because we think God loving me means I'm happy, I've got a full belly, and I've got no problems. And that is not what this book says. It doesn't say that. It says, pick up your cross and follow me. I love you. I'm with you. Always. I'm never leaving you. And again, 
may you trust this reorienting process that in the kingdom of God, you really are third. God really is first. Others really are second. And as important as you are, and you are very important, you are third. And when you begin to live that way, guess what? You are happy and content. Because if you chase after happiness, you're never going to get happy. But if you live this out with God's help, if you live this out, you'll see what I'm talking about. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory of God in the church, and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever and ever. Amen. Amen.